show your face, gain entry, the security feature at a Southeast Portland convenience store, giving privacy advocates something to worry about. The Gresham Bakers, who refused to make a cake for a gay wedding, win a partial victory at the Supreme Court. How things could play out differently this time around. Hold your noses. After this video goes viral, more Portlanders now coming forward with tales of exploring the sewers of the Rose City. Tonight on KGW News at 6. And we start with breaking news, a missing transgender woman out of Vancouver. Police there are sending us this photo of Nikki Kuhnhausen, last seen leaving her home on Wednesday, June 5th, almost two weeks ago. She's about five foot eight inches tall, 120 pounds, she has black hair. If you spot her or know anything about her whereabouts, please call 911. One of the highest profile Oregon court cases in history is back in the spotlight, a Gresham bakery that refused to bake a wedding cake for a lesbian couple. Now the U.S. Supreme Court is sending that case back down to the state level. KGW's Pat Doris is here to break down this latest development for us, Pat. Well, it's really interesting, Laurel. The long running court battle involves a bakery called Sweet Cakes by Melissa. The bakery was fined for refusing to make a wedding cake for that lesbian couple, and they have been appealing ever since. This is Melissa Klein, the Melissa behind Sweet Cakes by Melissa. I hope they're doing well and, and I wish them well. Six years on, she hopes Laurel and Rachel Bowman Cryer are well. That's the couple who wanted a wedding cake and filed a complaint with the Oregon Labor Secretary when they were denied because of the Klein's religious beliefs. The Labor Commissioner found the Klein's broke state law by discriminating based on sexual orientation. The Klein's appealed saying in part that the cake is an artistic expression and protected by their First Amendment rights. They've lost every step of the way until now. Well, the moment I heard was my husband called me this morning and woke me up and, um, and he told me and I was, I was definitely, um, it kind of was a moment that we've been eagerly waiting for. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court told Oregon's Court of Appeals to take a second look at the case in light of the high court's ruling involving a Colorado baker. In that case, the court found a Colorado commission unfairly discriminated against the baker because of his religious beliefs. The Klein's lawyers are ready. The Supreme Court is giving us an opportunity to go back to the Oregon Court of Appeals and, and make that very argument, to make the argument that um, the Aaron and Melissa Klein had faced religious hostility from the Oregon commissioner. The Oregon Attorney General is ready too. She issued a statement that reads in part, we will continue to defend the constitutionality of Oregon's laws that require bakeries and other places of public accommodation to serve all customers regardless of sexual orientation. The Kleins closed their bakery after the complaint to the Labor Commissioner and they were fined $135,000. They have paid that amount, they told me. It's sitting in a trust waiting for the end of the case. Back to you. All right, Pat, we'll continue to wait on the uh, next development as they will continue to come. Thank you. you I'm going to turn now to technology straight out of science fiction, and it's turning up at a gas station of all places in inner southwest, southeast. And if you've been to the Jacksons on Southeast Grand, you may not have seen it but it's most likely seeing you. The company installed facial recognition technology there and at other stores. They say it's to prevent theft by controlling who's allowed in the store. But as you would imagine, maybe some of you are feeling this at home. Not everyone is in love with this idea. KGW's Morgan Romero live for us outside of the Jacksons with a look at how it's all working there. Morgan. Yeah, Dan and Laurel, there's a somewhat noticeable camera at the entrance of this Jackson store behind me. And the idea is that it recognizes the face of people caught for things like shoplifting and robbery and denies them access into the store. The sign there says, look at camera for entry, facial recognition and use. Regulars tell me they first noticed it a couple months ago. And when I tried it out today, I just walked at a normal pace looking straight ahead and the doors opened up for me. Jason Phoebus is a regular here. He typically hits up the Jacksons on Southeast Grand Avenue around 3 a.m. before work. Uh, it was a couple months ago. I was, went to walk in first thing in the morning because my hat and stuff, it wouldn't unlock for me. So I was like yanking on the door and I had to look up at the camera and move my hat and stuff. So. That's when he realized Jacksons was using facial recognition technology. I'm not sure how I feel about my face being stored in some database somewhere, but... I'm not jacking anything, so I don't really care, honestly. <laughs> Who does seem to care, Phoebus and other regulars say, are thieves. 
and those concerned over privacy. They used to be packed like really early in the mornings when I'd come in. Um, now there's almost like nobody in there. A lot of people don't like the whole Big Brother's watching thing, I guess. I think it's a new way of the future. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to hide. This sign over the door shows Blue Line Technology designed it. Their website says the system is synced with door locks. The doors won't open unless the facial recognition system clears it. Also on their website, it says people don't need to pause or even look up for the camera to read their face. In a statement, Jackson said in part, quote, this particular solution has shown to significantly reduce incidences of crime for other similar retailers. That said, no solution is perfect, and we acknowledge public apprehension. I think it's for the greater good. Jeliza Black didn't notice the camera. No, just walked in the store and just did everything like normal. But sees it as a good deterrent to shoplifters. And I've seen clothes stores shut down because of so much crime. Um, of ju they're just losing so much product and they just can't keep up. Uh, people, I know the clerks are scared, so I think this is going to help. Last year, the ACLU called out Amazon and the Washington County Sheriff's Office for using facial recognition technology, saying law enforcement could build a system to automate the identification and tracking of anyone. In a blog post, the ACLU said it poses problems of private companies compiling blacklists, misjudging people, and not providing due process. They say it threatens to bring sweeping changes to public life. In their statement, Jackson says it doesn't share or receive any information or photos from other databases. All captured info is stored for less than 48 hours, except when a crime is committed. Jackson tells us the software will not be installed at all their locations. I reached out to them multiple times today to ask them what hours the software is in use, what crimes you can be banned from the store for, and what exactly can happen if you want to appeal it if you've been misidentified, but they haven't returned any of my emails. Back to you. What? I mean, this is just so interesting to me and to so many people at home too. Morgan, thank you so much. If you're sitting at home, yeah. mulling this over, wondering how you feel about it, we'd like to know, are you okay with Jackson's using facial recognition technology as security. This is our viewer voice poll right now. Answer is yes or no. Let us know. Go to KGW.com slash vote or by using the KGW app. Just tap on the viewer voice tab. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. So Portland firefighters, they found a woman today inside of a trash container of a downtown apartment building with life-threatening injuries. Turns out she had fallen seven or 16 stories down a trash chute. It happened at a high-rise building on Burnside, right across from Providence Park. It's not really clear uh, why she was in that chute to begin with, but police say it appears she is not a resident of that building and may have some mental health issues. Boeing executives are apologizing to families who lost loved ones when two 737 MAX planes crashed. The company CEO spoke at a news conference today. He didn't say when the MAX flights would resume, but he did say they're making progress. Test pilots have flown more than 280 flights with updated software. I've been in this industry for 30 plus years, and this is the most trying of times. But without a doubt, is a pivotal moment for all of us. It's a time to capture learning. It's a time to be introspective. And it's a time for us to make sure accidents like this never happen again. The 737 MAX fleet has been grounded for three months following deadly crashes in Ethiopia and Indonesia. Investigators are looking into the cause, but acknowledge the jet's automatic flight control system played a role. The Golden Gate Bridge, obviously one of the most recognizable bridges in the world, but it also has a dark reputation as a place where many people come to end their lives. Now a Portland company is working to change that. KGW's Keely Chalmers visited that company. She's live for us in Southwest Portland. Keely, tell us more, what are they doing? Well, guys, that company is Vigor Industrial. It's best known for building and repairing massive ships, but its latest project is one that will go above the water and underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. It's being constructed inside this warehouse in Clackamas and piece by piece. It's being added to the iconic Golden Gate Bridge, a suicide deterrent system. But this is not a fence or any kind of barrier like that. In fact, once installed, this system will be barely noticeable. For the most part, uh, these 
devices, this net system, will not be visible from the roadway. People really won't notice it. But it will do its job and do it very, very well. The net system is going in about 20 feet below the bottom deck of the bridge. About a quarter of the system's already in place. The rest is still being manufactured. It's made out of stainless steel and will eventually span the entire length of the bridge. That's nearly 9,000 feet. And most important, it will be impossible to jump over. Uh, statistics show that once these systems are in place, the attempts pretty much stop. This is going to prevent a lot of people from dying by suicide. It's a project David Westbrook with the suicide prevention nonprofit group Lines for Life says works. There's good research that when you prevent somebody from dying in one spot or by one method, that those individuals never go on to die by suicide. And that's partly because it's such an impetuous act. In fact, the group believes a similar system could be installed on the Vista Bridge in southwest Portland. Up until about five years ago, the historic bridge averaged two suicide attempts a year. But when this fence was installed, the suicide attempts stopped. However, the fencing was meant as a temporary solution, and some neighbors would like a more attractive permanent solution. The folks at Vigor believe that can be done. Can the engineers come in and design something that will be aesthetically a little more appealing? I certainly hope so, and I certainly believe they can, and we'd be here to help them do that. And Vigor says it can also be done at a much lower cost. The Golden Gate Bridge Project has an estimated price tag of more than $200 million. But again, that bridge is more than 9,000 feet long. In comparison, the Vista Bridge is less than 250 feet. Back to you. Thank you, Keely. And still to come, a tragic break in the case of a missing mom and child. How the suspect's history helped them track down their remains. Plus, if you were like us and you thought this kind of stuff was rare, think again. Ahead, another Portlander talks about his time exploring the sewers of the city. I'm Matt Safino. Lots of clouds out the coast with sunshine inland, and we've got both in our forecast, including a few showers for the first time in a while. And guess what? KGW Shred Day is back this Saturday from 8 to noon. Come by and shred one box of documents for free. We'll be set up at two locations, Clackamas Promenade and at Westview High School. The Make-A-Wish Foundation will also be there with us accepting donations to help local kids fighting critical illnesses. We hope to see you there.